Um, so we have, um, I don't know, about uh, a dozen slides or so uh, in this presentation. We have about an hour, so I think we have plenty of time uh, to discuss some of the highlights of the Smarter Balance Assessment Consortium. We um, uh, are, again, thankful for your participation and uh, do look forward to the opportunity for some discussion and questions uh, as you see fit. Uh, let's skip ahead to the next slide, please. So Smarter Balanced is a consortium uh, that covers many states uh, in the country. Those states that are in green are what we refer to as governing states. These are states that are fully engaged in the consortium's work and are at the uh, uh, policy uh, level of making decisions. Uh, next click, we'll animate this slide a little bit. Okay, there we go. Uh, there are 24 uh, states uh, total, uh, which is about 40% of the students in the country. 21 of those states are the green states that are governing states. Um, and a governing state is a state, as I say, that uh, has a voice at the policy table, does vote on key uh, policy matters for the consortium. And each one of these uh, 21 governing states has what we refer to as a K-12 lead uh, who sits on our governing panel and also a higher education lead uh, who uh, carries forth uh, policy matters to the higher education community uh, in their state um, and uh, can uh, uh, chime in on votes uh, necessary for higher education policy issues. Three states are in blue on this map. Uh, they're what we refer to as advisory states. These are states that have not necessarily fully yet committed to smarter balance. Um, a couple of those states are in uh, more than one uh, consortium. Uh, they may well also belong to the PARC consortium. For the most part, the states that are in gray belong to the second of the two assessment consortiums across the country, uh, known as PARC. And the PARC states are the uh, other states on the map, aside from five states which uh, belong to neither consortium. Uh, actually, I think at this point, it's six states belonging to, belong to neither consortium. And those six are Alaska, Utah, Minnesota, Nebraska, um, Virginia, And I may have forgotten one, I guess, in Texas. Um, let's uh, move forward to one more quick, Amy. Uh, the uh, state of Washington plays a unique role uh, in the consortium. There's a little red star up there by Washington. Because the state of Washington, uh, through the governor's office and the uh, uh, chief state school officer, um, uh, are the fiscal agent for the grant. So the U.S. Department of Education has made possible the development of these assessments uh, through a grant of, through a Race to the Top grant. And the actual award uh, for, on behalf of the entire consortium went to the state of Washington, which means that Washington is the state that issues the procurement rules. Washington um, uh, establishes contracts with vendors and contractors uh, to monitor and manage the work of the consortium. Uh, finally, Westhead, uh, which is located in the Bay Area in California, is our project management partner. And uh, those, that means that they handle various logistic, uh, logistical issues for us, uh, monitor our archives and so forth and so on. As a matter of fact, this uh, webinar is being hosted by Westhead. So might have an example of some of their work. Uh, before we go to the next slide, let me just make a particular call out to the state of Washington and the job that they have done on um, being the fiscal agent for this state. Um, you all know that uh, on a regular basis, uh, your state auditor's office uh, does audit the activities within state agencies. Um, and in this year's audit of the education agency in the state of Washington, the auditors chose to audit the Smarter Balanced Assessment Consortium and all of the activities uh, inherent in that consortium uh, for the previous fiscal year. Um, and this resulted in an audit that had uh, not only no findings, but also no recommendations. Um, and that, uh, as you all know, in the audit community is extremely rare. Uh, and uh, our hats off to the state of Washington for doing such a great job of uh, handling our uh, finances in such a responsible manner 
um, that the auditors uh, took a careful look at us and uh, found that we were doing everything properly and according to uh, state requirements. So congratulations, Washington. Uh, next slide, please, Amy. Uh, there are a, a series of uh, bullets on this slide. We'll take them one at a time. Uh, each one of these bullets uh, describe requirements that were set forth in the Race to the Top grant that was awarded to Smarter Balance, and the same requirements hold for the grant that was awarded to PARC. So we are building an assessment system uh, to meet these requirements. Uh, first and foremost, an assessment system that is aligned to the Common Core State Standards um, in Mathematics and language, English Language Arts Literacy. This means, uh, of course, uh, that that's the, the scope of our assessment. Uh, so we are not building science tests. We are not building social studies tests and so forth and so on. But we are building mathematics and English language arts uh, and literacy uh, assessments for our member states. These assessments will be used uh, for federal accountability purposes, uh, meaning that the assessments occur in grades three through eight and at least once in high school. And in the case of Smarter Balance, that is in 11th grade in high school. I'll say a little bit more about that in a little bit, but let's move to the next bullet. These assessments will be more rigorous than the assessments that we already see in most of our states. Uh, the reason for that is that the purpose of these assessments and actually uh, the purpose of the Common Core State Standards is to align uh, learning standards for students in K through 12 uh, with the expectations for college and career. As a matter of fact, performance on the high school assessment uh, in Smarter Balance will signal to higher education that students are ready to move into credit-bearing courses without remediation. Let me say that again. Adequate performance on the 11th grade assessment in Smarter Balance will mean that students are prepared to move into credit-bearing courses when they enter college or university and can avoid remediation, be exempt from remediation. So within your own states, uh, for the folks who are on the call, uh, think for a minute about uh, how many of your 11th graders, uh, first of all, actually graduate. And of that proportion of students, how many of them uh, actually go on to higher education? and that's community college or college or university. And then how many of them do not require any remediation? We'll probably come up with a number around 35% or something like that. And it will vary from state to state, but it'll be on the order of 35%. That's about what we're looking at with regard to the level of rigor in these assessments. We anticipate that in the final analysis, the expectations of these new assessments aligned to these new sta learning standards for students will mean that there will be uh, far fewer students actually being declared as uh, having met those standards uh, in these first few years. Um, and in addition to that, uh, although I've only been talking about high school, remember in the middle school, those test results are supposed to be uh, a pointer or uh, providing direction to students with regard to where is the student headed as they're moving into high school. So the standards on that assessment will be uh, fairly rigorous as well. And down into elementary school, that should be a signal to how do, what students should expect in the upcoming grades. So this notion of more rigor actually will cascade down through the grades and uh, establish for our member states uh, a, a set of expectations that uh, ex actually exceed what we're currently expecting of our students. Next bullet, please. Uh, what we expect of our students will be common across all states in the consortium. Uh, so there is a requirement in the grant uh, that the uh, expectations for students in Maine, which is a member state, are the same as the expectations for students in California, which is a member state. Uh, which is the same as South Carolina, which is the same as Washington and all the states in between. So all of the member states of Smarter Balance will, in fact, use common cuts, what we refer to as cut scores or common standard uh, performance standards across all of our consortium states. Uh, I'll say a word here to mention to you that 
uh, although the federal grant does not require that there is any agreement across both the park states and the Smarter Balance states, uh, the two consortia, Park and Smarter Balance, have agreed with each other that we will establish a common uh, uh, performance criteria across these cut scores. So in the final analysis, as long as a state is a member of one consortium or the other, uh, the state-to-state -state comparisons will hold, and uh, parents uh, and uh, institutions of higher education and other important stakeholders will be able to uh, be confident that the performance uh, of students in all states that are members of either one of these consortia is an apples-to-apples -apples comparison. Next slide, please, or next bullet, please. Uh, we will provide both achievement information, that is, what percent of students have met standard, for example, and growth information, how much are individual students growing from year to year to year. Uh, this is not only important, uh, obviously, for students and parents to know how they're improving. It's important for teachers to know how well they're doing with regard to providing growth for their students. In many states and districts have actually adopted uh, evaluation criteria for staff that rely upon growth uh, information. And we are required as a consortium to develop an assessment that provides information about student growth that can be used in these various ways. Next. Um, we're required to develop a valid, reliable, and fair assessment for all students, uh, except for those with a significant cognitive disabilities. Uh, currently, students in your state uh, with significant cognitive disabilities are assessed with a separate assessment uh, in their federal accountability assessment, and that will continue to be the case. But for Smarter Balance and uh, for the other consortium, uh, we both need to make sure that our assessment is valid, reliable, and fair for students with disabilities, uh, for students uh, who are English language learners, and for students in any kinds of different uh, uh, presenting circumstances to the assessment that the um, reasonableness of the scores and the fairness of the scores will hold. Uh, we only have three more bullets here. One more is uh, using multiple measures meaning that this will not be your grandmother's Oldsmobile. Uh, we will actually be uh, not only asking students to complete selected response or multiple choice type questions, but uh, there will be uh, some technology enhanced questions where they have the opportunity to use the mouse and the uh, computer screen to uh, manipulate uh, figures and graphics on the page. Uh, there will be constructed response items that expect students to provide an answer as opposed to just selecting an answer. And there will be extended response items that expect students to write extended text in response to a question. So we will be assessing students in many multiple different ways. Uh, second to last bullet comes up that these assessments are required to be administered online, uh, meaning that students will have to uh, use a computer uh, to participate in the assessment program. I have a separate slide about the online issue, and I know many of you likely have questions about that, so I'll postpone further comments uh, until a little bit later on. And finally, uh, we are required to go operational in 1415, which means that in the spring of 2015, uh, these assessments uh, for our member states will be used for their federal accountability assessment and for other assessment purposes in, uh, in your state. Um, and in the fall of 2014, we will first make available uh, a, a number of support materials uh, that I think you'll uh, understand what those are as we move through this presentation. So let me, uh, that's a big mouthful, a lot of bullets here on this page, a lot of text. Let me pause for just a moment, see if there's any questions. Well, I don't, don't hear anything or see anything in the chat area, so I'll go ahead and move forward. So next slide. Uh, so we're happy to report that Smarter Balance has a deep commitment to being a state-led uh, organization uh, and that we are committed to transparency about our work. So although we are using state uh, race to the top funds, so it, although we did get a federal grant 
for this assessment development. Uh, that grant was written by and the project is governed by member states. Um, and that has been true from before we got the grant, as we, as state uh, members gathered together to write the application for this race to the top uh, resources. Uh, this has been a state-led organization uh, from the very get-go. Uh, and uh, no policies move forward without the states approving it. Uh, and uh, it's a, a value that we hold dear and uh, one that we uh, continue to implement. Uh, our leadership is uh, in the form of uh, K-12 and higher education representatives. As I mentioned, each state has a K-12 representative and a higher education representative. Within your state, if you want to learn more about Smarter Balance, I would suggest that your first point of contact be the assessment director within your state education agency. Uh, that person uh, certainly knows the nuts and bolts of what's going on with Smarter Balance uh, probably better than anyone else within the state. Naturally, I stand at the ready to answer any questions that you have, but um, your question is most likely to be a question of a local nature within your state, and uh, that's the person who can help you first. Um, all of our decisions are subject to a state vote uh, of a policy matter, and uh, we uh, uh, we hold uh, true to that uh, to that value. We've also involved uh, almost a hundred uh, staff from uh, from states. This includes uh, uh, state education agency staff and uh, college and higher ed faculty um, in the form of what we call work groups. Uh, we have about ten different areas of work that we've divided up. Uh, some work on uh, writing items and tasks some work on uh, accommodations and accessibility for uh, students in special populations, um, a work group worked on uh, validity and, and measurement questions for us, another work group uh, works on helping states transition to the common core. So there's just a, a lot of uh, landscape there for us to divide up the work and we, uh, we draw upon the expertise uh, that our different states bring to us. This assessment consortium is a unique opportunity to uh, to learn, uh, to take advantage of what we learned from No Child Left Behind testing, what we did wrong and what we did right. And there's expertise around the country in doing different kinds of things quite well. Um, and the advantage of a consortium is that we can learn from everybody and the experience that we had over the past dozen years or so with No Child Left Behind. Uh, we have contracts with some of the nation's leading testing companies uh, to help us in this work. And I think the fact is we, uh, up till now, have probably had a contract with every testing company uh, of any note that's out there. And so we've been drawing upon the, the expertise from the business community. We are also drawing on advice from uh, uh, several standing committees uh, that are comprising, uh, that comprise national experts uh, in the technical areas, also in working with English language learners, uh, students with disabilities, uh, uh, the, the uh, area of careers, the areas of, of, uh, of college expectations, and so forth and so on. And finally, everything that is not a secure document, because uh, to release it would uh, expose areas of the test that we can't release. Uh, everything that we do is transparent and open on our uh, website. And so if you or your legislative staff uh, want to know about some of the actions that we've taken, we can uh, guide you through some of, uh, some of that uh, location of those materials. So let's talk for a second about what our assessment design actually looks like. Uh, next slide, Amy. Uh, this is a, a graphic of uh, what the uh, overall design looks like. Um, the slide on the, the dark gray area on the left uh, states that we have these common core state standards uh, that set expectations for students. That's a great thing to have. Off on the right is having students leave high school, college, and career ready. That is a great and laudable goal. Um, we all want to move from the left to the right. We all Sorry want to have that. That's OK. Uh, we all want to have that happen. Uh, the question is, how do we get there? We could probably get uh, to having students leaving high school, college, career ready without any testing at all. It's 
a bitter pill for a testing person to swallow to admit that, uh, but it is probably, in fact, the truth. Um, but the fact of the matter is, uh, people in the Smarter Balance Consortium actually are committed to the notion that information matters. That if you have good, high quality information, that can make a difference in quality teaching and learning. So we're committed to providing quality information to teachers, uh, students, principals, and education stakeholders. So that's our core belief. We're going to do that in three ways. Uh, the first way is at the top of the triangle, and that's through our summative assessment system. Our summative assessment system is the end of the year assessment. It is a secure test. It is uh, held, uh, you know, the items are held in a secure area so they cannot be uh, practiced upon and so forth and so on. It is given online. It takes advantage of something called computer adaptive technology, a computer adaptive testing. And a computer adaptive testing is a means uh, of getting a very accurate score for every student very quickly. Uh, and we do this by uh, taking advantage of knowing uh, what the student, how the student has answered previous questions. If the student has been answering questions correctly, well, they should probably be getting harder questions. Uh, and if a student has been answering questions incorrectly, they should probably be getting easier questions. So the computer can monitor this and can actually hone in very quickly on exactly where, what it is that students know and can do in a particular topic area. So the computer adaptive testing cycles through the various topic areas and finds out where the student is on the achievement scale in each one of those. The advantage here is a lot of efficiency, and the advantage here is a lot of precision in what we're saying about individual students. Uh, and that's important if you're going to measure growth. Um, if uh, any of you have kept track of own uh, by putting little marks on the door jam uh, as they've grown up through the years. Uh, you know that it's important if you're going to measure growth between ages eight and eight and a half, that you actually get a good measurement at age eight and a good measurement at eight, eight, age eight and a half. Otherwise, your son or daughter might think that they're shrinking in height if you had bad measurement as the pretest score. The disadvantage, quite frankly, to computer adaptive testing is that it does go item by item by item. And not all learning and not all testing is just one question at a time. A lot of learning, in fact, is based on real world problems, where you're asked to look at a given scenario, a given situation, and bring to bear a lot of what you know about a topic area to address a given question. So for that reason, we have a second component of our summative assessment. In addition to computer adaptive testing, we have something that's called performance tasks. And the performance tasks are part of the summative assessment system and are, are real world problems that are posed to the student and ask them to solve in a scenario based uh, arrangement uh, a, question, a series of questions built around a, a single stimulus. In mathematics, for example, we might ask a student uh, to design a, a, a playground uh, where a certain amount of space needs to be set aside for the merry-go-round, a certain amount of space set aside for the swing set, a certain amount of space uh, set aside for a, uh, a basketball court, and how much space do you need, and how would you arrange the spaces that you need so that there can be uh, adequate flow, how much uh, beauty bark do you have to, how many cubic yards of beauty bark would you have to order if you need it to be four inches thick, and this is the size uh, of the rectangle that you need to fill with beauty bark, on and on and on. I think you can see that these performance tasks could be uh, rather engaging, but also ask students to bring to the task a number of knowledge and skills that they have acquired. So we're now ready for the second uh, component of the assessment system. Next slide, there we go. Um, the summative assessment, as I said, is a secure assessment. The interim assessment is an open assessment. Same sets of the test questions. They've been developed at the same time. I mean, they're actual different questions, but they've been developed in the same manner, uh, using the same criteria, the same quality control procedures. It's just that we make the interim questions available to teachers to look at, to review, 
to, so they can learn what is actually likely to be the kinds of questions you'll find on the test. The interim assessment will build for teachers a test that they can give during the year based on a portion of the standard. So for example, a teacher or a classroom or a school might decide, uh, I don't know, I, February of eighth grade, let's give a writing assessment so they can draw upon Sorry, my battery just went dead for a second. I'm back. Um, and uh, they can draw upon all of the uh, resources in Smarter Balance to give a writing test uh, that would uh, that would be given to their eighth grade students. Uh, another school might decide that at the beginning of fifth grade in the fall they want to give a proxy for the entire uh, end of the year assessment. They can call upon the interim assessment to do that, and uh, that would occur. So the interim assessment is extremely flexible. It's available for schools and teachers to use. The Smarter Balanced will not design when the interim assessments occur, whether the interim assessments occur. Uh, it will simply make this available as a resource for our member states. The final component is a formative component. You know, formative assessment is the assessment that occurs day in, day out, in the classroom with teachers working with kids. Uh, we do not intend to build assessments or test questions for the formative resource. It would be presumptuous of a Smarter Balance to think that it could build a test for every possible circumstance of every teacher in the consortium and the kind of teaching that goes on in every classroom. After all, teachers are best when they are left uh, to their own uh, uh, experience and creativity and knowledge of their students uh, to adjust their lessons as they're moving through them. What we intend to do with the formative resources is to improve teachers' skills at giving good assessments. Uh, there are skills that you can learn about what makes classroom tests good and what makes them uh, not so good or relatively trivial for students, and we want to help teachers in this regard so this will be an area for professional development, for pre-service development, for folks beginning to learn how to enter the teaching uh, workforce uh, that we think can improve the, the status and the quality of assessment as it goes on day to day in classroom instruction. So that's the whole system. We refer to this as an assessment system. We think that Smarter Balance is not just a test, it really is about an information system based on quality assessments uh, throughout the year and at the end of the year to monitor how students and schools are performing. Uh, we have a, uh, let's see, I have a question coming in. Um, so a, a question was posed with regard to the formative and whether or not those are predetermined assessments or a bank of items that teachers and schools can use. Uh, I think our initial design is it will probably be both. Um, it will be predetermined in the sense that there would be a menu that schools and teachers could choose from. There would be some predetermined assessments that we think are likely to be the most popular. Uh, but it would also have the added flexibility for uh, folks who uh, perhaps want to explore and do something a little bit um, off uh, off the standard menu uh, and do a replacement. So if they want mashed potatoes instead of green beans, they can uh, request that as a special order and it would design that particular assessment for them. But we will have a menu to make life a little bit easy for our teachers. So let's move to the next slide. As we're doing this, um, I do want to acknowledge that Daniel Thatcher has joined our call from NCSL. So Daniel, let me give you a couple minutes to see if you want to say a few words of welcome to our uh, folks on the call. Sure, thank you. Um, and can you hear me, Dr. Joe? Yes, I can. Oh. Okay, great, great, thank you. Well, I apologize for uh, jumping on late. I was having technical difficulties with my browser uh, at work here. Um, but I, I do want to thank you very much for taking the time to be here with us this afternoon. We at NCSL have surveyed our constituents, legislators, and legislative staff 
uh, on what are their top concerns regarding the Common Core state standards, and repeatedly the feedback we get is that the questions they have are around the assessment. So that's why uh, we are working uh, with you and um, and uh, in our meetings focusing on the assessments. And in fact, legislation that's been introduced so far this year, I've been able to identify over 100 bills that deal in some way with the Common Core state standards, and just about half of those uh, in some way deal with the assessment. So um, thank you, this is very timely. Um, and uh, I, one last thing is that we here at NCSL, NCSL are preparing a toolkit for legislators and legislative staff to be available uh, later on in the springtime. And it will have um, uh, a number of menu items and policy levers to consider as uh, you move forward with implementing the assessments and the, the Common Core state standards. So be looking for that. Uh, but that's, that's all I would like to say right now. Thank you for being here and, and for doing this. Great, Daniel. I appreciate it. And uh, these slides will be available to everyone who's on the call. Is that right? That's right. Great. Great. Um, so uh, th this slide I, I think you might find useful. I, I tried to break out uh, the, the different kinds of things that we're doing. This, is just has, this slide just has to do with the summative assessment. So this is only considering the, these secure assessments um, where uh, students get uh, a score uh, at, where the testing occurs at the end of the year. Uh, first of all, that first row in grades 3 through 8 and 11, um, the purpose would be school district state accountability, and the primary user there um, is the U.S. Department of Education through the Elementary Secondary Education Act and No Child Left Behind. Um, so this is the federal accountability piece. Uh, and so that's kind of our primary purpose, so we put that up there. The next one is for 11th graders only. Uh, the purpose would, in addition to that school and district accountability, the 11th grade test has a unique accountability um, uh, consequences for 11th graders. Namely, it will declare whether or not students are ready for credit-bearing college coursework. So the primary user of that will be institutions of higher education. Uh, and they will be using that uh, tool to indicate whether or not the student has become exempt from uh, requiring remedial, uh, remedial work uh, in college or university. Uh, stepping down, we're also going to be providing uh, secure assessments that states can use for 9th, 10th, and 12th grade. Remember, we have the 11th grade test, but if states, we recognize that many states, for example, have end-of-course testing. Many states have graduation requirements that they want to start giving students an opportunity to take in, in say, the ninth grade or the tenth grade. Um, and many states have uh, teacher evaluation programs that require a monitoring student growth uh, across grade to grade to grade and not just jumping to grade 11. So there are many different purposes here. But we want you to know that the state is primarily the customer here. The state decides uh, what the uh, necessary use is and could design 9th, 10th, and 12th grade assessments using the Smarter Balance system and using items in the Smarter Balance pool for its own, uh, for its own purposes and uh, needs. And then finally, in grades 3 through 8 and 11, using the regular Smarter Balanced Assessment, we do uh, acknowledge that some states or, in fact, some districts have uh, evaluation procedures in place that require uh, taking a look at student growth from year to year, uh, and that our assessment could be used for that particular purpose, and that would be a state or a district decision. Uh, that's not a federal decision. That's not necessarily a federal requirement. Uh, but it is something that states and districts uh, may have already decided to do or may be deciding to do in the future. So uh, I think this slide kind of captures the various uses and purposes and who kind of our customers are with regard to those uses and purposes for the uh, secure assessment. Next slide. Um, what we've uh, got here is some major milestones. Uh, you know, we write a lot of test questions and we need to try them out. Right now, we are implementing our pilot assessment. It is a major accomplishment. We are piloting right now about uh, 5,000 items uh, that will be viewed by almost three quarters of a million students. Uh, so I'll say a little bit more about the pilot in detail on the next slide. Uh, but for this slide, uh, 
A year from now, we have uh, the field test of a full bank of about 40,000 items uh, that will be viewed uh, to uh, 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 almost 10 million students uh, across the consortium. And finally, we will be deploying the, um, uh, the fully operational uh, assessment system in September of 14. So uh, the great news is that the pilot assessment is up and running. It started on February 20th, um, and uh, we have a help desk active for folks to call for help. Uh, we're not getting many calls on the help desk. Uh, the assessment system uh, is running in a healthy fashion. And actually, the tool that students use to take the pilot test is the beta version of the final tool that students will use in the final operational test. So in addition to field testing items, we're field testing uh, our own uh, delivery system. And things up to this point uh, seem to be working, be working very smoothly. So we're extremely excited about that. Let me say a, a, just a little bit more about the pilot test. So go ahead to the next slide. As I said, it began uh, uh, on the 20th. It runs all the way through May 24th, about three quarters of a million students in 4,000 schools. Why are we doing it? Well, a number of reasons. We want to evaluate the reasonableness of the items that we've developed so far to make sure we're on the right track. So are, for example, are our performance tasks working well? And, that, and are they getting and extracting from students the kind of information we hope to gain from students? Um, can we computer score these open-ended questions? To what extent can we rely on artificial intelligence scoring? And to what uh, extent do we have to uh, rely, continue to rely on hand scoring? Which, as you all know, is more expensive than, than uh, computer scoring. Uh, how well do students use our online tools? Um, what's, are there any biasing situations with regard to our tests? Are, we're looking carefully at language uh, interference uh, on some of our items and um, familiarity with, uh, with computers with regard to uh, our students who are less likely to have a computer in the house um, on survey questions. We ask them, do they perform less poorly than students who are very familiar with computers? And finally, taking a close look at the technical issues of, say, grade-to-grade -grade growth, and can we track that well? So a fifth grader in the pilot may see a fourth grade item in addition to fifth grade items so that we can look at this grade-to-grade -grade growth and see how it's tracking. Next slide. Uh, I have a, a, a several slides here that address questions that I anticipated would be things that you're asking about. So I. Um, have really four uh, four slides: one about technology, one about costs, and one about uh, uh, I'm sorry, three slides in addition to the pilot, and one about uh, sustaining uh, this effort. So the technology uh, question is: um, uh, I want you to know that we have available for all of our districts and uh, schools, and, and of course states something we refer to as the readiness tool. If you contact your state assessment director and say you want to learn more about the technology readiness tool, they will know exactly what you're talking about. This is a tool that schools and districts can use to enter into uh, an online uh, survey the uh, kinds of uh, computers that they have at the school and the kind of bandwidth they have at the school, and it will give back to them a gap analysis of whether or not they have a sufficient amount of computing to administer the Smarter Balanced Assessment. The summary reports are now available to schools and districts, so those reports are out there. Uh, and this tool is a, is a living survey. So as, as things and situations change, uh, schools can go in and upgrade and update and can get an updated report. Sadly, not all schools and districts are uh, completing this uh, survey. Um, and so it's difficult for states to know exactly where the states stand with regard to the computer readiness, because if not everyone has responded to the survey, it's hard to tell uh, what the situation is out there. Uh, so we are continuing to encourage schools and districts uh, to complete the survey. We have standards for new and existing hardware. Naturally, the standards for new hardware are more rigorous than the standards for existing hardware. Uh, if you're going to go out and buy a new machine or new equipment, we can tell you what that should be. Uh, also, schools have equipment on the floor right now. 
uh, that they actually can use. And so we have minimum standards required for existing hardware. We have designed the existing stand, the technology standards for existing hardware to really truly be the minimum that you need. Uh, we want to get as many kids available to take these online tests as possible. Um, and so they are, um, actually the minimum standards for existing hardware is pretty thin and uh, you probably would not want to be doing a lot of Google searches on those equipments because the screen will take a long time to load. But we are writing our file sizes for our items to be small enough that they can load quite quickly. Um, final note, you do not need to have one-to-one -one computing to give this uh, assessment. Um, actually, we anticipate that probably something on the order of uh, one to five or one to seven uh, would be more than adequate to administer the assessment. Uh, so the, this notion of because it's an online test, every student needs to have a computer uh, is, is not true. Uh, what is true is you need to have enough uh, machines available in the school so that students can cycle through and, uh, and take advantage of the extended testing window to take the test. Uh, next slide. So what is this going to cost? Uh, that is a great question, of course. Um, there have been a couple of recent uh, independent studies, uh, one conducted by Stanford, one conducted by Brookings, um, that came up with essentially the same result. Um, and they surveyed a number of states. The, the particular states these two uh, studies surveyed were different. Uh, the methodology they used was actually a little bit different, and, but they came up with pretty much the same answer, that typically across the country, states are spending about $35 per student on testing. Um, and uh, this is just for the, you know, no child left behind required testing. Uh, it's about 35 bucks a kid. Um, there are uh, operational costs that will have to go forward uh, with regard to Smarter Balanced. We are developing the assessment, so we have already owned the costs uh, that states would have to pay uh, to build the test. But there are ongoing operational costs uh, starting in the first year, uh, which are necessary, for example, to pay for the hand scoring, to pay for hosting of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, computer servers, uh, the records management that keeps track of uh, making sure that the student who started the test on Tuesday and then, and then finished it on a Wednesday and then took the math test on Thursday, that all of those responses get attached to the same student, even if the student moves to a new school district in the middle of the testing. Um, so that's kind of all this records management work, which does take some back-end work. Quality control, making sure that the um, that items that end up uh, misbehaving or being uh, having errors in them and so forth and so on are caught and captured and removed and replaced with new items and so forth and so on. So there are a number of operational costs um, just to keep the assessment running once we go live. We did a cost estimate in June of 2010. It looked like that was about $20 per student for the summative assessment only. So that's at grades three through eight and 11, just the top of that triangle that I showed you a little bit earlier, just with the summative assessment is about 20 bucks a kid. The, if you add the interim informative, the two bottom parts of that triangle, it adds about another $7 per student. So the total cost for Smarter Balanced is about 27 bucks a kid, as opposed to the average of about $35 a student uh, across the country now. Now, some of you are celebrating this slide right now because we're coming in a whole lot cheaper than you are right now. Uh, some of you are uh, bemoaning this slide because we're coming in more expensive than you are right now. If we're coming in more expensive, it's because, for example, we're, we are assessing writing every year. And you probably are not assessing writing every year, if, uh, if at all, if you're substantially cheaper than this. Uh, and then there's a third group of you who aren't neither celebrating uh, nor bemoaning this slide, but wondering what it means for you because you don't really know right at this moment what your cost per student is. Um, and, but again, once again, the folks in your assessment office uh, in your uh, state agency do know, 
and uh, they can get that information for you and do have a sense of what your cost, uh, relative costs would be. I will tell you that we have uh, contracted uh, with a company uh, that is independent of us, so we're not looking at our own naval, uh, to update our cost estimates um, for uh, Smarter Balanced right now. Um, and those are due in early March. Uh, by the end of the first week of March, we should have the preliminary results from that cost estimate. And we will be sharing that as quickly as we get it with the K-12 state leads uh, in the consortium. And I'm sure they'll be able to get it to you or, or your staff. Next slide. Finally, you know, this is a federal grant that expires September 30th, 2014. And uh, at that point in time, uh, someone turns off the lights and uh, the resources go dark. So we need to figure out how we're going to sustain this effort so that we can continue to support states uh, with this assessment because there will be calls to the help desk. There will be uh, needs uh, and requests for services and, and help and assistance and ongoing maintenance of the uh, item quality and so forth and so on. Uh, we were fortunate uh, to be able to draw upon a grant resource made available to us uh, from the National Governors Association and the Chief State School Officers Organization. Um, and uh, they uh, contracted with McKinsey and Company to help us build a business model and a business plan uh, and to figure out what our costs are likely to be and to how to, uh, how to uh, characterize those. We'll be built, bringing that business model to our uh, chiefs, uh, to the chiefs in our governing states, when we meet with them on March 20th uh, in Washington, D.C. at what we call our collaboration conference. Um, and we will be presenting the business plan to them at that time, uh, and that will include our model for sustainability. And, um, and those costs on the previous page are captured entirely uh, in this uh, sustainability plan. So the sustainability plan does not add costs um, to the costing from the previous slide. It, it simply partitions the cost into, you know, what are the various categories uh, of the costs and what can we tell states about how much these assessments are truly likely to cost uh, once we go live. Uh, last slide is our website. Uh, smarterbalance.org, so we welcome you to go there. There's a lot of information there, uh, and so we please invite you to go to our website. Uh, and as I had hoped, I was able to finish with a few minutes left, so we do have the opportunity to respond to questions you may have. Well, I see that we have a pretty large crowd on uh, online right now. It's, uh, I don't know, I just scrolled down the chat area, it probably looks like uh, 30 or 35 folks or something like that. Um, and uh, so I, I know some of you may have, uh, may have questions in your mind and you're just wondering if maybe you're the only one that has that question or it's unique to you or whatever. So I will repeat what I said before and that is, uh, if you do have a question, uh, I first of all invite you to ask your um, your state uh, K-12 uh, assessment director um, uh, if they can help out because they uh, uh, have all of the information I've shared with you today are things that they know. Um, and uh, secondly, uh, it, although I've said that, uh, invite you to uh, call upon myself, uh, Jackie King, um, uh, or uh, the folks at NCSL, uh, Daniel and colleagues, to uh, see if there's uh, any way that, that we can offer help to you. Uh, we know and appreciate the, the hard work that you all do uh, in your legislative work uh, and uh, know that as soon as people start talking about assessment, eyes glaze over and so forth and so on, and it just assume the conversation ends as quickly as possible. Um, but uh, we do uh, want to help in any way that we can. These can be complex issues, um, and uh, we'd like to offer what whatever help uh, is uh, possible for us to help uh, to uh, to uh, see what we can do to make your jobs easier. 
Uh, Jackie, I'm going to turn it back to you. Thank you, Joe. Um, Bob, we do have one question that came in. Where can we find the McKinsey and Company business plan and cost estimates? Okay, that is uh, that is still under uh, still under development, and it is being presented to our um, uh, K twelve leads in our governing states on March sixth, and then uh, to our chiefs on March twentieth. So, uh, sometime in early March, there will be a posting on our website. Uh, you would likely be able to uh, find it uh, by going to our website, and as as you go there, that top panel. Uh, rotates and there's sort of like a latest news area you can see at the bottom of the slide we have on the screen right now uh, near the bottom it says latest news and when it's posted we'll put it there we also have a uh, a weekly update uh, that we make available to interested uh, partners um, and uh, if you have uh, lead staff uh, in your uh, House or Senate Education Committees who would like to be a subscriber to the uh, Smarter Balance Weekly Update, um, please uh, let uh, Daniel uh, know about that. He can send us an uh, email list and we can make sure that their names get added to the uh, Weekly Update uh, subscription list and it would certainly be posted when we, uh, when we have it ready for release to be posted in there. Other questions that folks might have in these last few moments? Well, I wanted to let you know that we do um, hope to work with NCSL to do these on a, on a fairly regular basis, perhaps um, once a quarter, um, uh, so that we can continue to keep you apprised um, of developments as the assessment consortium moves forward with its work. Um, uh, but that there's no need to wait for those those webinars to check in. We're always um, available and and happy to answer um, whatever questions you may have. Um, working through your state assessment uh, offices um, will probably get you the most state specific question. But if there's things that come up that um, they can't answer, they absolutely know how to reach us as well. So. Um, Daniel, anything you'd like to say before we before we finish? Uh, I don't. I just want to thank you again for engaging us and uh, and our constituents, the state legislators and the legislative staff. And um, it's, traditionally, this has been a process that hasn't involved uh, our constituents. Uh, so kudos to you for engaging us. We really appreciate it. And um, and I echo that we continue. We will plan on continuing to co-host webinars. Uh, and in, engage one another in where we can to provide as much information and resources to staff and to legislators where needed. So we got one last question while um, uh, while we were wrapping up. Um, I won't I won't keep folks who need to leave, but we'll stay on the line. The question that came in um, is how is the computer based online system used to evaluate writing? Can you provide more details? Sure can. Um, you know, it turns out that computer scoring of writing is something that is an evolving field. Uh, it can, computers can score writing pretty darn well if what our, what our interested, interest is is the quality of the writing itself. Um, the, uh, the proper syntax is being used, uh, the you know, punctuation is in the right place, uh, actually even whether there's a general theme that's been followed. Um, and the computers actually can score about as well as people can. So we do intend to rely on artificial intelligence scoring for that. On the other hand, if you're talking about writing um, to a particular theme, um, like, uh, you know, what, uh, what were the causes of Hamlet's dilemma, or uh, um, uh, what were the, you know, the leading economic factors uh, that led to World War I, or something like that, it's uh, that's a little bit trickier for the computers and things like that we're going to have to ask uh, people to score uh, for now anyway and we will continue a research effort to expand what we can learn about computer scoring the 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 problem with writing is that that heretofore it's been so expensive to score that the fact is that it's just simply not tested 
And when you don't test writing and all you do is use multiple choice questions, you don't get students actually doing writing in classrooms. But if writing as writing is on the assessment, then writing as writing actually happens in the classroom. And then kids learn how to write. Because write, being a good writer is about practice and feedback. Um, so we're going to try to maximize the uh, affordability of this uh, as much as we can and, uh, and really uh, try to go to uh, uh, what the computers can provide for us with regard to artificial intelligence scoring. But at this point in time, we do not think that we can completely rely on artificial intelligence scoring, but we will be using it to some extent.